It's January the 28th. Let's read the Bible. Welcome back, friends, to this year-long journey from Genesis to Revelation in just one year. And here we are, almost to the end of January, almost one month in to our year-long journey by God's grace. And we've done Genesis, first 15 Psalms. We're in the book of Exodus and about halfway through Exodus. So we're, we're right on schedule. It's going great. Thank you so much for being with us. Got a note the other day from my friend Stu Page. If you are acquainted with Word of Life, especially Word of Life Bible Institute, then you probably know the name Stu Page. For many, many years, Stu Page was the executive dean of the Word of Life Bible Institute. I first met him 40-some years ago, and I went up there as a young man to teach at the Bible Institute, to teach the book of Hebrews. But in recent years, I've gotten to know Stu very well. Uh, because he and Betty have a place in the RV park down at Hudson, Florida, on the campus of Word of Life Bible Conference and Bible Institute. Anyway, Stu is a great friend, and he wrote me this note the other day. He said, now that all the videos are posted and we are starting the second year of reading the Bible through with you, I have refreshed my morning routine. I get up, make coffee, get a glass of ice water, and put on my keep believing wristband and open the good word for the day to read the Bible with you. He says, I usually wake up at 5 a.m. Then he adds, I know one thing. I'm reading the Bible each year with you as long as I'm alive and functioning. And if it's allowed, I'll even do it in heaven. Thanks so much for doing this. I thought to myself, wow, what? That's the spirit. Stu says, if it's allowed, I'll even do it in heaven. He's one of the greatest men I've ever known, Stu and Betty, dear friends. And so, Stu, thank you, Betty. Thank you. And uh, I love that. If it's allowed, I'll even do it in heaven. I don't know about the Wi-Fi connection between heaven and earth, but I love the Spirit. Whether on earth or in heaven, we're going to love the Word of God. And that's, I think, the truly Christian point of view. I think that's what this Bible reading is all about. Now, today, we've come to one of the big mountain peaks of the Bible itself. We're going to come to the Ten Commandments. In just a moment, we're going to read Exodus 19, 20, and 21. Exodus 19 is the preparation for the giving of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. Then Exodus 21, that begins the list of the various laws for the daily life of the Israelites in the wilderness and later when they came into the Promised Land. So, Lord, we're praying that you will speak to us Speak to us clearly and powerfully from your word today, from this important passage. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus 19, the third month, from the very day the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim, came to the Sinai wilderness, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Moses went up the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites after Moses came back. He summoned the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people responded together, We will do all that the Lord has spoken. So Moses brought the people's words back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. And the Lord told Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. They must wash their clothes and be prepared by the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put boundaries for the people all around the mountain and say, Be careful that you don't go up on the mountain or touch its base. Anyone who touches the mountain must be put to death. No hand may touch him. Instead, he will be stoned or shot with arrows and not live, whether animal or human. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, They may go up the mountain. Then Moses came down from the mountain to the people and consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, Be prepared by the third day. Do not have sexual relations with women. On the third day, when morning came, 
There was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud blast from a ram's horn, so that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and he went up. The Lord directed Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, many of them will die. Even the priests who come near the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out in anger against them. Moses responded to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai since you warned us. Put a boundary around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord replied to him, Go down and come back with Aaron. But the priests and the people must not break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out in anger against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Now, later on, month of December, we're going to come to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. In fact, we're going to get near the end of the book of Hebrews, about Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and when the writer of Hebrews comes to that, that's the next to the last chapter in the book, the writer the he, uh, of Hebrews is going to refer back to Exodus 19, to the darkness, to the clouds, to the lightning, to the thunder, to the whole point of how scary and forbidding it was when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And he's going to compare the, the dread and fear surrounding the giving of the law with the blessing that is ours of freedom through the new covenant guaranteed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So stick around, folks. What we've just read is going to come into play in the month of December. Now, Exodus 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow in worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the ram's horn, and the mountains surrounded by smoke. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. You speak to us, and we will listen, they said to Moses, but don't let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses responded to the people, don't be afraid, for God has come to test you, so that you will fear him and will not sin. And the people remained standing at a distance as Moses approached the total darkness where God was. Then the Lord told Moses, this is what you were to say to the Israelites. You have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make gods of silver to rival me. Do not make gods of gold for yourselves. Make an earthen altar for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your flocks and herds. I will come to you and bless you in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. If you make a stone altar for me, do not build it out of cut stones. If you use your chisel on it, you will defile it. Do not go up to my altar on steps so that your nakedness is not exposed on it. 
So there you have the Ten Commandments and a warning against idolatry and another statement about how frightening this whole scene is. The thunder and uh, and the ram's horn and the darkness. And then the command, if you build an altar, don't use a chisel on it, use uncut stones. Now, Exodus 21. And verse 1 says, these are the ordinances. Here's the civil law. This is how the people are to treat each other. These are the ordinances that you are to set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he is to serve for six years. Then in the seventh, he is to leave as a free man without paying anything. If he arrives alone, he is to leave alone. If he arrives with a wife, his wife is to leave with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children belong to her master and the man must leave alone. But if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I do not want to leave as a free man. His master is to bring him to the judges and then bring him to the door or doorpost. His master will pierce his ear with an awl and he will serve his master for life. When a man sells his daughter as a concubine, she is not to leave as the male slaves do. If she is displeasing to her master who chose her for himself, then he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has acted treacherously toward her. Or if he chooses her for his son, he must deal with her according to the customary treatment of daughters. If he takes an additional wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing, or marital rights of the first wife. And if he does not do these three things for her, she may leave free of charge without any payment. Whoever strikes a person so that he dies must be put to death. But if he did not intend any harm, and yet God allowed it to happen, I will appoint a place for you where he may flee. If a person schemes and willfully acts against his neighbor to murder him, you must take him from my altar to be put to death. Whoever strikes his father or mother must be put to death. Whoever kidnaps a person must be put to death, whether he sells him or the person is found in his possession. Whoever curses his father or his mother must be put to death. When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or his fist and the injured man does not die but is confined to bed, if he can later get up and walk around outside leaning on a staff, then the one who struck him will be exempt from punishment. Nevertheless, he must pay for his lost work time and provide for his complete recovery. When a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and the, and the slave dies under his abuse, the owner must be punished. However, if the slave can stand up after a day or two, the owner should not be punished because he is his owner's property. When men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, but there is no injury, the one who hit her must be fined as the woman's husband demands from him, and he must pay according to judicial assessment. If there is an injury, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. When a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he must let the slave go free in comp compensation for his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his male or female slave, he must let the slave go free in compensation for his tooth. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox must be stoned and its meat may not be eaten. But the ox's owner is innocent. However, if the ox was in the habit of goring and its owner had been warned yet does not restrain it and it kills a man or a woman, the ox must be stoned and its owner must also be put to death. If instead a ransom is demanded of him, he can pay a redemption price for his life in the full amount demanded from him. If it gores a son or daughter, he is to be dealt with according to the same law. If the ox gores a male or female slave, he must give 30 shekels of silver to the slave's master and the ox must be stoned. When a man uncovers a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit must give compensation. He must pay to its owner, but the dead animal will become his. When a man's ox injures his neighbor's ox and it dies, they must sell the live ox and divide its proceeds. They must also divide the dead animal. If, however, it is known that the ox was in the habit of goring, yet its owner has not restrained it, he must compensate fully. Ox for ox, the dead animal will become his. About this last chapter, you understand, they didn't have a police force. They didn't have 911. They didn't, they, I mean, they were just becoming a nation. 
These are very basic laws. But it's, it's interesting. The capital punishment that's in here should be put to death, shall be put to death, shall be put to death. And it's also interesting to me, it was said here, uh, the, the law of retribution, life for life, eye for eye, ear for ear, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Thus, God enforces justice among his people. What should we say about the Ten Commandments? Well, stay tuned uh, down the road. Eventually, in the fall, we're going to get to the wonderful book of, or I guess maybe this summer, summer of the fall, we're going to get to the wonderful book of Galatians. And uh, when we get to the book of Galatians, the whole question is going to be, is the law good or bad? Because Paul's going to say, by the deeds of the law, which is, you know, Exodus 20 especially, the Ten Commandments, no other gods, no idols, don't take God's name in vain, keep the Sabbath, honor your father and mother, don't murder, don't commit adultery, uh, don't steal, don't bear false witness. And the one that tripped up the Apostle Paul, he says that in the book of Romans, he went through the first nine, but he said, I'm okay, but then he got to 10, don't covet. And he realized that just that reveal, that revealed to him the sin in his own heart. Is the law good or bad? Well, anybody who thinks they're going to go to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, I mean, nice try. And I think in America, you could you could go on the streets of Kansas City, certainly in Chicago, because certainly in Pittsburgh or Boston or New York, some of these great big metropolitan areas, and you could talk to church-going people or people who don't even go to church and ask them, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And they'll, almost everybody say the same thing. Well, I, I don't know. I hope so. But I'm trying to be a good person. And you ask them, well, how good do you have to be? Well, I'm trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Nobody has ever kept the Ten Commandments perfectly except one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, in our hearts, we've broken all ten of the commandments. You're a, you're a lawbreaker, and so am I. That's really the whole point of Galatians. By the deeds of the law, no one will be justified. It is only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean this law is no good? No. The, the law is like an x-ray. It's like, you know, the other day I was, uh, well, I was I was out, it was icy, and I, I was Sadie, our Aussie doodle, taking her for a walk on the ice, and uh, yeah, it was a foolish thing, but a car came, and I was trying to get Sadie to the side of the road, and I did not even see that little bit of ice. I didn't see it until I hit it with full force on my left shoulder. And it, it still hurts. Almost a week later, it, it still hurts. Had to go see the doctor. What do you do? He didn't poke around a little bit, but he said, we're going to do a, 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 an x-ray. And the x-ray showed, well, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, but he said, no broken bones. Okay. He said, we can also do an MRI, and maybe we should, and maybe we will. Just haven't gotten around to to that yet. We'll see how things go. But look, doesn't matter. The CAT scan doesn't give you cancer. MRI doesn't, MRI doesn't mess up my shoulder. If there's a mess in there with my rotator cuff, the MRI only reveals what's already there. See, that's what the law does. The law is like an x-ray of the soul. It, it shows us how deep our sin is. It reveals our sin and points us to the cross, to the only person ever who kept the law of God perfectly, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not saved by the deeds of the law, but the law is good and not bad because it shows us, shows us our sin. It points us to Jesus. And in the case of the Ten Commandments, it shows us the path of holiness. Well, we ought to thank God for what we've read today. This is great stuff. Let's go out with grateful hearts. Remember, we all need the Lord. If we can read the Ten Commandments and point the finger at our brother or sister, we've missed the point. These commandments, they are for us. They can't create life, but they can point us to the one who can give life, the Lord Jesus Christ. So rejoice that you know him, Jesus, who fulfilled the law, who took our sin and our punishment as lawbreakers. He took that and gave us his righteousness, the best deal in the world. If that doesn't make you smile, I don't know what else to say. 
Friends, go out and have a great God-blessed day. Come back tomorrow. We're going to read some more of these unusual laws from ancient Israel, and we're going to, well, I don't want to tell you some, some unusual things are about. This story has some twists and turns to it, so come back tomorrow. We're going to do this again. God bless.